Merry Christmas. How's everybody doing tonight? Come on. I have the absolute great privilege of kind of capping off our Advent journey together as a church. My name is Rob Wilton. I, ha- I serve as the uh, lead pastor of Vintage Church, and I want to welcome you, especially if you're a first-time guest with us in the house. Can we give it up for our first-time guests in the house? Thank you so much for being here. We would love to be a part of your family. I hope that you'll connect into our church family and what God's doing through this faith family in this city and around the world. So I have the privilege of lighting the Christ candle. We have taken a journey over the last few weeks together through the Advent season. And as we have considered this birth of Christ that we're so excited to celebrate this coming weekend together, we have celebrated hope, that hope is found in Jesus. We have celebrated peace, that peace is found in Jesus. We've celebrated that um, joy is found in Jesus. Tonight, we've celebrated that love is found in Jesus. And this middle candle represents Christ who provides hope, joy, peace, and love. I want to read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 23 tonight. It says, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being just a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call His name, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Everybody say Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Which means God with us. God with us us. Anyone thankful in the house that it wasn't left to us to go to God, but that God came to us? Anybody thankful in the house? (laughs) Christmas is all about our great God becoming flesh and dwelling among us, dying for us and saving the world through his death, burial, and resurrection. The great John Wesley, the very last words that were uttered out of his mouth before he died were this. The greatest statement of all is God with us. And so you see it up on the wall, God with us. This word Emmanuel is the fulfilled promise of God. And so when you consider this word Emmanuel and the way in which we translate it, God with us, you can simply break it down. I love breaking things down. I love points. I usually alliterate most points because alliteration is anointed from God. I'm just letting you know that, especially for simple people like me that have to remember things. And so you break down this text, this description of Emmanuel. First of all, we consider God. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus Christ is God. And Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, came bringing God to us. This beautiful statement doesn't just end with God, this creator God who created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was God, right? Not us, 
That would solve every problem in the world if we would just recognize that. We didn't come first, he did. In the beginning was God, and he is Lord. We don't make him Lord. In the beginning was God, but God showed mercy to us. God demonstrated love to us, and that while we're still sinners, Christ came to us. He died for us, and so we consider God with. God came as a baby. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about y'all. I hate saying this, but if I was God, I, I would want to enter into my creation something a little more powerful than a baby. Babies are so helpless, aren't they? But they're so awesome. Sitting by Roman over there, he's about to come, and little Roman, our little man, he's starting to get all, you know, wiggly on us. But when they first come out, man, they're helpless. They don't move at all. They're unbelievable. I've got four kids, my wife Annabeth and I. Annabeth was singing up here. We've got four kids. Bolt, my oldest, he's like his mama. Doesn't love physical touch. And so this guy who loves physical touch didn't get much cuddle time with that kid, especially when he grew up. So I miss the baby days with Bolt. Mac and Burke are my twin boys. They're a couple steps away from jail, just being real. <laughs> Pray for me. But my twin boys, Mac and Burke, um, Mac is like his older brother. He also doesn't like physical touch. And so I, I miss my moments where I could just cuddle. But Burke, um, he takes physical touch to a dangerous place. It's an overbearing physical touch. But then the Lord blessed me and gave me a princess for our fourth. Her name's Carolina McCall. I, I called my boys by their first names. We gave them easy one-syllable yelling names. I can get it out real quick. Bo, Mac, Burke, here! Right? But I enjoy her name because she's my favorite. <laughs> and so I say, Carolina McCall. And she has the absolute perfect amount of cuddle time. And so God shined on me. But when we consider babies, right? Don't lose sight that this God with Jesus came as a baby. Think about the humility. Think about how much he wanted to relate. Think about how he came. This mighty, powerful God humbled himself by becoming flesh. God with. But can we praise God that the full statement of Emmanuel is God with us? I do want you to know that that us is an exclusive us. This Emmanuel, this God with us, the us that's being referred to are all those who surrender their lives to Emmanuel. God with us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That us is all those who are in Christ Jesus. We call that his church. At Vintage Church, we don't believe we go to church. We believe we are the church. The church is not a nonprofit with the state of Louisiana. It's not a building. It's not a place you go. It's the people of God. It's all those who have been saved by the gospel of Jesus. And if you get to hang out with this church family, not one of us in this room are perfect. We are desperately in need of the one who is. And what binds us together as a church family called Vintage Church in New Orleans is that we have repented of our sin and we have put our faith and trust in Jesus. We have received the free gift of Christmas. Do you know that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone? No amount of religion will get you to God. No amount of your mama, I'm a mama's boy, I'll confess that. Mama can't save you. Giving money can't save you. We're saved by grace through faith in Emmanuel alone. And in just a few moments, I want to offer you an opportunity to give your life to Christ. Because all of mankind, just in case you're giving church a try, maybe, you know, you, you try and find a church every Christmas. We're so glad that you're here. Um, in the house, raise your hand if you're a sinner. 
<laughs> See, we're all screwed up in this place. So just know I'm kind of leading the way in that. We're all desperately crying out for help. And I want you to know that this Emmanuel declares that we have been heard. I also want you to know that we don't just cry out in this world and, and God hears us, but that God loves us. He loves us so much, he demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ came, he lived, he died, and he defeated sin, death, and hell for us. I want you to know that here in this room, not only have you been heard, but you have been loved. But thirdly, I offer to you that if you tonight would receive this free gift of grace in Christ Jesus, that you can be changed. I want to introduce to you someone who has been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's been my great honor to become um, a chaplain with the New Orleans Saints. And I've had the great privilege of getting to know a number of different players. Some of my friends are here tonight. And my wife and I, we just consider it an incredible blessing to be a part of that ministry. One great friend that I've gotten to know is a guy by the name of Roman Harper. Can y'all give it up for Super Bowl champion, Mr. Roman Harper? And throw in a little hoot at if you want to. Now listen, let's just kick it right out. Just let these people know that I stood strong at your wedding in the heart of Panther country and I yelled who dat right before you married Heather. That Just is confirm true. confirm that. That is true. Not only that, but he talked trash behind it too. It was like, <laughs> I don't care where you're at. It's who dat nation all day. <laughs> and my teammates were ready to try and jump him like once we stopped and people were having drinks and not paying attention to the pastor. They kind of cornered him off over there by somewhere. They, they didn't just corner me. They picked me up, moved me over to the side. Your entire defensive teammates cornered me and threatened my life. But I yelled, who that? <laughs> I mean, can we just be honest? Who do you think God's team is? <laughs> you think God's a Panthers fan or a saint? Come on now. I mean, it's easy. So uh, we forgive Roman for that little time that he spent away, but... I appreciate uh, it. Have we got a football? Where, where's our football? Let's go ahead and bring it down. Come on, Weaver. Bring it down. Listen, um, a whole bunch of people came in, mm -hmm. signed some things, and gave us some information to win a football. And so we're going to pick a name out of a hat before you sign it, and then that person's going to raise their hand. Now, listen, truth be told, the people who came here early, so let's bless them a little bit. They're at the bottom. So okay. dig real deep. Yeah, yeah. Pick a name real deep first. Let's, let's find a name. Let's see who wins this football. And then uh, you read out the name, and let's see who wins this football tonight. Uh, Chad Ramirez. Chad Ramirez. Where's Chad? Now, you got to stay there. We're going to see if Roman can play quarterback. I definitely uh, can. You can? We, can? we got this. All right, so, so Roman, why don't you sign it? Uh, hook Chad up. Maybe write it to Chad. Make yep. it personal. Um, we don't want no Panther stuff on there. A little hoot at something. And uh, Chad, you ready for this? Mark, you need to sit down, brother. <laughs> this is dangerous. This dude plays defense. I'm not guaranteeing. All of y'all, be careful. I'm not guaranteeing no accuracy here. All right, Roman. You, you got some guys believing in you. All right, let's see. Let's see what. The, let's see what this goes. Oh, nice. Yeah, Lee. Sign him up. I played quarterback in high school. Woo! So you played quarterback in high school, and then what was that high school team you played for in college? Uh, University of Alabama. Oh. The, the best university in the world. Is that community, Roll tie. community college? That... We accept those. We accept those. <laughs> hey, so Roman, look, thank you so much. Can we thank God for uh, Roman Harper being here? Roman, tell us about Roman Harper, where you grew up. Tell us a little bit about your life and uh, maybe that brought you to football, playing football. 
Yeah, so for all you guys that don't know me, I'm, a, I'm Roman Harper. I'm from a small town in Alabama called Prattville, Alabama. I was born and raised there. It's right outside of Montgomery, dead smack in the middle of the state, about two and a half hours to every corner. Um, growing up, I have three older brothers, one younger sister. I was the baby for quite a long time, and I'm still treated as the baby before my sister came. Um, and um, growing up, I had both parents. Uh, my dad was a high school teacher and a coach for 30 years. He taught me, he coached me. Uh, my mom worked for the Department of Transportation. They were always there, always made me focus on all the right things. And you know, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Um, raising me the right way. I grew up in the church. I was in the choir, so looking at these kids earlier singing, I was like, I remember when I was that day, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was not a great singer, because I remember the one time I really thought I was getting into the spirit at choir practice, and I was really singing and singing, and I was like really feeling, I felt like I was moving, like I was going well, and, and the, the, the music guy was like, hey, stop, stop, stop. Who is that that's off key? I was like, oh, <laughs> I think that was me. Yeah. So I, uh, my, my, trust me, my choir days were very short-lived, but uh, it was good, though. So I always grew up in the church, um, and I still go to my same church, Lee Baptist Church, when I'm back home uh, with me and my family. And uh, so I went all the way through high school. Um, I, when I grown up, I wanted to be an astronaut and a doctor. I'm, I'm very, I'm not afraid, I'm afraid of heights, so the astronaut was not a good thing. <laughs> I wanted to be a doctor, but I really is kind of, I'm not, I'm very kind of queasy around blood. And I just have always been blessed and, and fortunate to have a talent in football. As far as I can go back, my oldest brother always had us playing in the yard. And I was always the littlest. My older brother was way bigger than me. I didn't catch up to him until I was 11th grade in high school. He was a senior. And, you know, I was always the small one just trying to keep up. And I was always Ronnie's little brother. And all growing up, I always just wanted to do different things. And where I'm from, nobody really makes it to the NFL. So I always just love football and I love competing and, and being in the yard and being around my brothers and my family. And, and lo and behold, as I start to grow up, I, I found out that I had a really talent in this game. And uh, it's allowed me to go on, get a scholarship from different schools. And I chose the University of Alabama. And, and, uh, and I chose Alabama for three things. And hopefully you kids will grow up and maybe have opportunities and things like that. But I chose the University of Alabama because it was Nike and I didn't want Russell Athletic anymore. Um, <laughs> their colors were similar to my high school colors. So I knew I looked good in it. Yep. yep. And then fresh, 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 like you right now. <laughs> and, uh, and number three was because I like one of the DB coaches. That was my deciding factor right there. And uh, luckily, my wife came with me, too, later on. Yeah. So tell us now your journey into the NFL mm -hmm. and, and maybe even share a little bit about your foundation, because yeah. uh, I know that that was something that, that got birthed within your heart while you're here in New Orleans and, yeah. and things started to, to kind of form there. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what happened at PAO uh, yeah. next. OK, so I. Um, I was, I redshirted my first year in college. Uh, after that, I was playing and had a pretty good, uh, successful career at the University of Alabama. Um, I had a great time. So um, I was later drafted by the New Orleans Saints. Um, I was out all the night before. Uh, and I told my parents I did not want to draft party or do anything big. I wanted, because I didn't know, my agent had told me I could be drafted anywhere from the second round to the fifth round. I knew I wasn't a first round guy just because Mel Kuyper and all these other draft experts said I was not a first rounder, so I didn't know. And I just wanted to go home and have a nice quiet time with my family. And if my name was called, I wanted to be around the people that love me and I love the most. So I go home, um, I get home by the time around this, around the end of the first round, second round's about to start. And I'm sitting there, I'm on my, uh, I don't know if any of you guys remember the T-Mobile the sidekick. So I was on my sidekick, I mean, somebody had some. So yeah, so I'm over here texting on my sidekick and uh, I get a phone call uh, my, to my parents' house. My mom was like, she's like, Roman, you got a phone call. Nobody would call me to my house. And I was like, well, who is she? She's like, I don't know, it sounds important though. So I answered it and it was uh, Mickey Loomis. He had called me and, uh, and he was saying that they were gonna draft me. And then I talked to Sean Payton, and then I talked to Gary Gibbs, who was the D coordinator, and we were talking for about five minutes or whatever, and then I hung up the phone, and my parents were like, well, who was it? I'm like, uh, nobody, because, you know, you hear those stories where people get told they're going to get drafted and all these other things, but it doesn't happen. 
And, uh, and then my name scrolled across. We had a you know big blowout party in the hometown of Prattville. It was good. Yeah, uh, yeah man, just hanging out with every. I mean, everybody in the city, I think, felt like they came by <laughs> at some point. And uh, it was good. And, you know, coming here, um, my college roommate told me that, you know, we'd be terrible because the Saints were really bad for a long time. And he laughed at me. He went in the fifth round, but he still laughed at me, though. And... Um, and I was just like, you know what, man, I don't care. It's a great opportunity, man. I'm just so happy. I, I'm going. It's close to home. Um, it's four and a half hours from my hometown. And I was just excited to have my name called. I just something, a dream uh, that I'd always wanted. And, and, uh, and now I have the opportunity to go play. And uh, Sean and all those guys seem very excited to have me. I come here. Um, the city of New Orleans, you hear all these great stories, these crazy things about it. And I get here right after Hurricane Katrina. And it was, you know, the city was crazy. I mean, uh, Walmart closed at like 7.30. It was different. Um, there was no street lights, half the places you look for somewhere to stay or somewhere to live. It was very, uh, it was a lot of displacement. You could see the water level driving down the interstate on uh, I-10 because I remember a friend of ours, Mike Ornstein, took me and Reggie Bush to look at places to live. And, and I was like, what is that brown mark? And the driver was like, oh, that was where the water line was at when Katrina hit. And the water sat here for a week. And I was just... I couldn't believe it. It was shocking. But, you know, as I got to know this city and as I started to play, uh, I felt the emotion and the raw feelings of the, the city when we got to come back after that first long training camp in Mississippi. And we got to play on that opening night on that Sunday night or Monday night game against Atlanta. And uh, when Gleason blocked the kick and I was I just happened to be in the building. You know, I didn't think anything of it. To me, it was just a normal, great game. The most exciting thing to me was playing against Michael Vick. I saw Michael Vick on the other side. And that was a big shock to me. But to be in that building, to see all the emotion of, of these people of New Orleans and the, the crying and all these other things after the game, it really kind of took me back for a moment and just made me see like, man, these are really legit good people. And uh, I want to make sure I enjoy myself, that my time here, and uh, give as much to this city as they give to this team and this organization. Well, Roman, I know that, uh, don't we thank Roman for his involvement in our community? And, um, I know that, that you have always been one that, that has gotten involved with Harper's Hope Foundation yeah. and, and, and serving, being available. I, I love all your teammates, man. Thank so many of the guys on, on this squad uh, roll up their sleeves. They don't just talk it, they walk mm -hmm. it and uh, are constantly just giving back, serving. Um, you know, this year you're the nominee uh, for the New Orleans Saints for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Mm -hmm. And so we're excited about that and Thank pulling you. for you. Um, but, but I know that a, a lot of this, especially over the last few years, um, it, it's bigger than philanthropy. Yeah. It's, it's bigger than just reaching out to, to help people in need. Um, I know that, that your faith um, drives this. Um, yeah. Even, uh, I'll never forget us talking on the phone um, when it became clear that you were heading back after disobeying God and going to the Panthers for a little while, uh, like you had anything to do with it. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, like, really? and, and so, you know, when, when we started to say, we started to say this word purpose um, and, and started to ask the Lord. It wasn't so clear, no. but, but Lord, what, what is the purpose? Because um, I was frustrated I had been journeying with you mm -hmm. um, as your chaplain, and um, we had just experienced something incredible at PAO. PAO is a conference held for NFL players after each season, and chaplains from around the league and players go. Um, and this year it was in San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor Miles McPherson yep, love Pastor was Miles. preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the invitation, um, man, the Lord just got a hold of you. And I'll never forget you coming and talking to me. Talk to me about that and maybe even the baptism and leading into um, really how the Lord began to place priorities of your faith in your life that um, has been such a blessing even for you and Heather and your kids. So I'll just kind of go back because it started way before that. Um, the first time I went to, uh, you know, this was years ago. I was, uh, I was still in New Orleans. I was playing and in the off season I would train in Los Angeles in a, uh, and so I'd go out there for two or three months. I'd, I'd, you know, enjoy myself and train majority, enjoy myself. And I was doing different things. And, you know, after the second year, third year going back out there, um, I, I was literally had everything that I could imagine. I, I was the highest paid player in my position in the NFL. I'd been to a couple of Pro Bowls. I'd won a Super Bowl. I was 
you know, I was fornicating with women. I was hanging out. I was thought I was hanging out with the highest of the highs. And at the end of the day, when I got home and I was, you know, in my right mind, I was just like, I was still feeling very empty. And I was, and I, I was starting to reach a place where I just wasn't in a great place. I felt like I was in a dark place. And I remember when I was at a restaurant, I was hanging out and I just was very, very uncomfortable with my surroundings. And, and I, I always prayed growing up and I always thought, you know, I just prayed. Why? Because that's what growing up in the church, that's what you're supposed to do. And, you know, for the first time, God spoke back to me. And you've heard of all the stories throughout the Bible of people praying and all these other things. You don't ever hear God talk to you and this, that and other. And the one time I felt like God talked to me, uh, he told me I needed to go get my girl and to that I wanted things in the right way. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be a great person. I wanted all these things, but I wanted it in the right way. I didn't want it for the wrong reasons. And that's what I was praying. I, and he told me what I needed to do. And I called my then, well, she, you know, she was my ex and then we broke up. And my wife now, I called her and uh, we started linking back up and hanging back out. And, and then I just I started reading my Bible, which I had never really read before. And for the first time, I felt like the spirit started to come in me. I started to um, regret some of the things that I was doing. I started to have reservation with some of the decisions that I was making. I started to, my life literally started to change right in front of myself. And I didn't know exactly what it was, but it was really just the Holy Spirit was finally starting to come in me. And I finally started to, to feel different about a lot of things. I, I started to become not so selfish as a man. I started to think about others before I made decisions. I started to live my life for, for my family and my, my wife then, uh, and you know, my, my daughter, our oldest daughter. And, and you know, as we're taking this journey, um, I made a lot, of, a lot of mistakes and, and I just will never forget um, when, when, I, when I made that decision to do that, you know, and, and uh, Heather and I went to PAO the first year and um, I was there with Charles Peanut Tillman, who I'm one of his best friends now. And, you know, Heather and I were going through our struggles and, I just never felt like I could get it right. And, uh, and as I've grown in my faith, I've, I've learned that, you know, you, everybody has a thorn in their side, and that's because God wants us to lean on him. And, uh, and I stopped blaming myself as I've grown in my faith and just understanding that as long as I stay right with God and continue to pray, I'm going to go through my ups and downs, my struggles. And uh, my first year in PAO, you know, they're talking about, man, you can just propose to her. Just go get married right now. And I just, whoa, whoa, whoa not ready for all that like you know I, I'm still you know teetering on the edge of what do I really want to be what are, who am I and it's a it's a rough decision and and then I remember after you know talking with Pastor Rob and all of a sudden now I'm starting to grow a little bit more in my faith more comfortable in who I am as a man and I remember that the, the following year when uh, Miles was out there talking and I decided I want to give my faith and I want to give my life to the to the Lord and uh, I got in that water that cold pool and I asked Rob to baptize me, and, uh, and he, he was so happy because he's seen my struggles, and I've talked to him about some different things that's going on in my life and uh, with my family and my faith and my, you know, my internal, my internal family. And, uh, and uh, I just said, I, I remember like it was yesterday that I wanted to pick up this cross and walk with Jesus because the things he did for us and uh, that he died for me and that I understand that now. And, um, and not only that, but... Just as I move forward, just um, and it, because of that, though, um, the things that's going on in my life uh, since then, you know, after I found myself saved or at least saved, you know, I thought I was I was still growing, though. I was not all the way ready. But, you know, my old coach used to tell me he's like, you know, because he was very happy that I got saved as well. But he was like, once you get saved, that's the easy part. Now it really starts to get hard because, you know. That's that's when it really the real walk starts. And uh, it was very tough, you know, just going back and forth and because you know what's right and what's wrong then. And you start to figure out what God really has for you. And it's not always easy. And um, so, you know, leading up to that, though, I'm so glad I did, because um, that was the summer right before my last year here in New Orleans. I, my last year here was a couple years ago. I tear up my knee. Um, I'm playing well. They draft some other people, and you know I'm out for nine games. I, if I didn't have my faith in my wife and 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 some people around me, some good solid people, I, there's no telling what I've been. But I stayed the course. I continued to keep my faith. I left. Um, my brother told me I was going to go to Carolina and win a Super Bowl. We didn't do that. 
But, you know, the first team that came calling was Carolina. And, and I was like, it has to be faith. Like, I, I got to go. And I talked to my wife about it. And she was like, well, babe, I support you, whatever you want to do. And we go there uh, on a whim. I sign. I have two, co two great years there. And after last year, um, uh, you know, I, I just didn't know what, what I was going to do. I, I didn't want the Super Bowl to be my last game I played because it was a loss. And lo and behold, I'm glad we lost it because I wouldn't be here now. I probably would have retired if, if we win that game. Like, there's no reason. What else am I holding on to, you know? And we lose. My wife is just emotionally drained. She retired. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, you know what, babe? I, I think I still want to go. I don't want that to be my last feeling of football is a Super Bowl loss. You know, I just, you know, I mean, I'm glad I won one before, but um, I don't want that to be my last feeling of football. I've done it so long. I don't want that to be my last one. So, you know, I started working out a little bit, but really trying to tread slowly and really enjoying time with my family and taking the kids to school and hanging out and, you know, fixing them breakfast, you know, washing them, things like that that I normally have never gotten to do. I really took time and really got to enjoy that. And, um, and next thing you know, Sean Payton's calling me. He wants me to come back and this, that, and the other. And I was just like, I don't know, I don't know. Um, sure, let's do it. And uh, when I get here, um, I, I had some frustrating times early in the season because I just didn't know, just like Pastor Rob said, my purpose was. You know, I don't do a lot of things without a purpose in life. You can't just do that. If you don't know what your purpose is, you'll believe anybody or they'll, you'll let them tell you whatever that you want to hear. And they'll, next thing you know, you're going down the wrong track. And that's because you don't have a purpose or a dream, a goal, some aspirations. And, uh, and I really, really struggled with what my purpose, what was, what was my, my calling for here in the, in the city of New Orleans. And, and maybe it's bigger than football. And I've talked to him about that and just how he has the, the light, the vision of, seeing all of New Orleans being saved at one point and uh, leading the cause in that and just, you know what, man, I'm diving in. I'm with you, Rob. So I, I want to continue to help try and push and, and push this community, push this city into a better place and do more. The same is done for me, help raising me as a man and, um, and just continue to grow in my faith. And, and now, lo and behold, man, I'm, uh, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I'm back on the field trying to help my teammates as much as I can. I try and have as much fun as I can. It's amazing to see the guys in that locker room, the growth that they've had, and as close as we are. And as even though the score has not always turned out the way we wanted it, but to see how tight we are. And this is one of the best group of guys I've, I've ever been around. And the fact that the things I've heard about that locker room before I got back this year is just nowhere even near the th great things I hear about and the issues. It's just amazing to see God at his work. The, the fact that how many people I see at chapel every week on Saturdays uh, is something that I get emotional about. I look in there and when I used to, you know, early in the year, it was like six guys, seven guys. You look in there now, it's like 20 guys. And just to see that, you know, it's not always about the scoreboard, but the fact the way God blesses us and the way he's using us and we ask him to be a light. Let us be that vessel. When we hear Luke McCown pray before the game or big Tony Hill pray before the game or now you see Brandon Cooks or somebody that you would never even think is a prayerable guy that would be praying before the game, like Mark Ingram, who's leading us. And it just moves us all. Uh, the, the spirit, when it flows through that locker room, that shower, and we're all prayer. Those are the things that really excites me and gets me going. And, uh, and to see that continue to move out and can see our growth, not always in the scoreboard, but as our faith has grown as a team and grow togetherness, I, I think it's real moving. I think it's been a great thing. Roman, thank you so much for sharing that, man. Thank you, brother. You know, we uh, get in a roll with you guys this past week to, to Arizona. Um, I, I know what's at your heart because we pray together. We talk about things. This man, after y'all did all your warm-ups, before you're going to come back out, it's kind of your last time. Um, God's using you. This dude was the last guy to leave the field because he refused to not encourage everyone back into that locker room. And there's just some things that are off script that God's empowered you to do. And keep on keeping on because it's a lot bigger than winning a Super Bowl. 
God's using you in a powerful way to lead people to Jesus. And the best is yet to come, Roman. Mm -hmm. I, I want y'all to know that what Jesus has done for me, by changing me, what Jesus has done for Roman, I want you to know here tonight, Jesus can do the same for you. Every head bowed and every eye closed in this moment. I want to invite you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus has come into this world, God with us. And He has lived, He has died, He has defeated sin, death, and hell to give you purpose, to give you hope, to give you a future. If you're here tonight and you'd say, Pastor Rob, I need hope. I need purpose. I need a future. I want you to know that you have been heard. The Holy Spirit's in this place and He hears you. He hears your cries. He hears your hopelessness. He hears your pain. You have been heard. I also want you to know that you are loved. We love because He first loved us. God so loved us that He gave that Son, this Emmanuel God with us. Would you embrace His love here tonight? Because I want you to know that if you would embrace His love here tonight, you can be changed. You can be transformed. You can go from death to life. So if you're here in this room and you'd say, that's me, Pastor Rob, I'm ready to receive the free gift of Jesus Christ. I want you right now to pray. God's word says that, therefore, if anyone would confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's you tonight. Come on. Call out to the Lord right there in your own heart. I'm not going to pray a prayer for you. I can't save you. You can come to Jesus just as you are. You don't have to get religious. You don't have to join a church. You come to Jesus just as you are. And you cry out to him and say, save me, Jesus. I give my life to you, Jesus. If that's you here tonight, You'd say, for the first time in my life, I've received the free gift of Christmas, of Emmanuel, God with us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, boldly lift your hand up in the air right now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I see. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, boldly lift that hand up. Jesus loves you so much. Hands going up all over the place. Praise the Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. If you're here tonight, and, and maybe you are here and you'd say, you know what, I'm giving church a try. It's Christmas. Everybody's kind of giving church a try. And, and I, I know Christ. I've, I've given my life to Christ, but I'm just not living for Christ the way I should right now. And, and you'd say tonight is a night of recommitment to the Lord. I want to reconnect with the purpose that God has for my life. I want to serve Him as best I can on and off the field. I want to give everything I have to God and, and His glory in this city. If that's you here tonight, you'd say, I just believe that tonight is kind of that, that reset, that restart in my life. Tonight is that, that re-energized commitment to the Lord. Boldly lift your hand up in the room. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I see you out there. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you that your salvation is here. Everyone look at me. We're going to close out tonight by singing a powerful song about this God with us.
But I just want, before we move forward, to let you know this. Some of you who gave your life to Christ, Romans said something so amazing. (laughs) He said, when he got saved, the real battles began. And I just assure you in this room, if tonight you've given your life to Christ, Satan is already after you. He hates that you would fall in love with Jesus. So I offer to you a church family or a friend that's with you. I want to encourage you to reach out and share with someone tonight about the fact that you gave your life to Christ. Out in our atrium, we have an amazing team that will connect with you. I want you to connect with us, okay? because we're here with you. We're not perfect. We're trying to desperately cling to a perfect God together. And we would love to help you in that. In the same light, if you're here tonight and you'd say, I'm on fire. I, I want to live my life for Jesus. I want to recommit my life to Christ. I want to I want to serve him with purpose. The enemy hates that. The enemy hates that. And not one of us in this room have been called to live for Christ alone. Join up with a church family. We'd love to have you. Find a church. I got amazing friends in this city that love Jesus. Other church families, so thankful for them. Find them, connect in, link arms. Roman, I I don't make it in this city without your friendship over the last few years. Thank you. Like that, God's people, GP. The GP. He's teaching me all kind of lingo. For those of you who are vintage that don't like this swag, just know he picks it out for me. I didn't even know what skinny jeans were until I met Roman Harper. See, we've turned that off. I got the mic. I'm the pastor around here. You're, you're on my field right now. You sit right there. You've done your part. I got the mic. Don't turn that mic back on. We need each other, don't we? And so let's stand together in unity and let's sing one closing song together and then I'm going to come up And I just want to pray for us a prayer of blessing as we go towards this Christmas weekend together. And as we go towards this new year together, can we believe together in Emmanuel, God with us, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I extend my hand out and I pray over these, your people, asking for you to do amazing work in and through your name for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.